Hello there, psychology students, and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today, we are going to review Unit 2, Topic 3, as we start our conversation about memory. Now, in order to help you remember all of this information about memory, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and take out your guided notes, which you can find by clicking the link down in the description below. Now, memory refers to the information that persists over time, acquired through various experiences, and can be stored and retrieved later on. Now, when it comes to memory, we have to understand that our memories of past events, experiences, and even our knowledge are not all the same. Memories are different and can be broken down by how they are processed, stored, and retrieved. The first type of memory that you want to be familiar with is explicit memory, which is information that you can consciously recall and explain to someone else. Sometimes explicit memory is called declarative memory, since you can declare it out loud. Now, there are two different types of explicit memory. The first is episodic memory, which is memories of personal experiences or specific events. For instance, your memory of your first victory royale in Fortnite. The second type is semantic memory, which is facts, concepts, and general knowledge. For example, remembering that the capital of France is Paris, or remembering that explicit memories are memories that you can consciously recall and explain to someone else. So that was explicit memory. Up next, there is implicit memory, which can consists of memories that are unconscious. These memories are actually harder to verbalize. Think of information or skills that you learn without even fully being aware of it. For instance, even if you haven't been on a bike in years, once you get on a bike, your body will remember how to balance and pedal without you having to consciously think through each step. Or when you drive home from school, you often don't think about every turn or street name. You just know the route, almost like you're on autopilot. All right, Maybe it's turn. a shortcut, Dwight. It said go to the right. It can't mean that. There's well, a lake there. I think it knows where it is going. This is the the lake. machine knows. This is the lake. Stop yelling at me. No, it's not Stop yelling. yelling. There's no lake here. These are examples of implicit memory, and more specifically, procedural memory, which is a type of implicit memory that helps us remember how to perform certain skills and routines, like riding a bike, typing, or tying your shoes. The last type of memory that we need to review is prospective memory, which is used for things that you need to do in the future. Essentially, this is your mental reminders. For example, remembering that you have a big test tomorrow, remembering to take medication at 8 a.m., or or remembering to subscribe at the end of this video. Sometimes prospective memory can be event-based. For instance, you see your backpack and it reminds you that you need to study for your test. And sometimes prospective memory is time-based, such as remembering to do something at a certain hour. All right, so that's the different types of memory. Now, if you wanna test your memory to see if you're truly understanding everything, you can take the practice quiz on the different types of memory in the ultimate review packet. You can find the link for it in the description of this video. So now that we understand the different types of memory, let's shift gears and talk about how memories are created in the first place. Psychologists have found that memory isn't just about storing information like a computer. Instead, it's tied to physical changes in the brain. One key process behind this is called long-term potentiation, which explains how repeated activation of certain neural pathways makes those connections stronger over time. This process strengthens the synaptic connections between neurons in the brain through repeated activation. Think of long-term potentiation like building a path through the woods. The first time you walk through, it's tough. You have to push through branches and long grass, but the more often you walk the same path, the clearer and easier it becomes. Your brain works the same way. When neurons fire together repeatedly, the connection between them gets stronger, allowing you to store and retain knowledge and skills over time. So we can see that long-term potentiation gives us insight into the biological process of how memories form and are strengthened. But that's actually only part of the process. We still need to look at how our mind actively uses memory, which is where the working memory model comes in. Now, when you hear the term working memory, think of it as an upgraded version of short-term memory, not just holding information, but actively working with it. It's like having a mental scratch pad where your brain does its problem solving in real time. Working memory is the brain primary system for holding and processing information while we use it. 
For example, cognitive tasks like solving a problem or following directions or even carrying on a conversation. There are four main components to this model that you need to be familiar with. First is the visual spatial sketch pad, often called the inner eye. This is where visual and spatial information is handled. This is what lets you imagine a scene in your head or mentally map out a route that you've walked before. For instance, if I asked you to picture your bedroom right now and count how many windows it has, well, you would use your visual spatial sketch pad to do so. Up next, there is the phonological loop, which deals with sounds and words. This can be broken down into two parts. The first is the phonological store, which is also called the inner ear. This is where spoken words are briefly held. The second part is the articulatory rehearsal process, also called the inner voice. This is what helps you repeat things to keep them active in your memory. For instance, when you hear a phone number and keep saying it to yourself just long enough to dial it, well, that's your phonological loop in action. Now, holding all of this together is the next component, and that is the central executive, which you can think of as the control center of working memory. This is what manages attention, coordinates the other systems, and helps you switch between tasks. For instance, if you're using my guided notes right now and taking notes on the video, the central executive helps you decide when to listen carefully and when to write things down. Now, since this model was created, it has been updated with the addition of the episode episodic buffer. This change helped fill in the gaps that the original model had. The episodic buffer acts as a temporary storage system that combines the different types of information into one meaningful piece. This explains how long-term memory integrates with working memory and how different types of information, such as sounds and visuals, are combined. Information from the phonological loop, visual spatial sketchpad, and long-term memory are brought together here and formed into a cohesive sequence. Now, I realize that this model can be a little confusing, so to make sure you're rock solid on it, I created an exclusive overview video of the model and a practice quiz to help you review and practice all of this information. You can find these resources inside my ultimate review packet. Okay, so the working memory model helps us understand how our brain actively processes and manipulates information in the moment, but we also need to understand how information actually moves through the different stages to become a long-lasting memory. And this is where the multi-store model comes in. The multi-store model explains how information is processed, stored, and retrieved. It focuses on three key systems that information must pass through if it's going to be remembered. According to this model, memory isn't just one big system. In fact, it's actually three interacting ones, with sensory memory, including iconic and echoic memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Together, these systems explain how information must be encoded stored and retrieved, and how both autonomic processing and effortful processing play a role in what we actually remember. All right, up first we have sensory memory. This is where you first encounter information from the environment. Here we can find iconic memory and echoic memory. Iconic memory is our visual sensory memory. This memory only lasts for a fraction of a second, while our echoic memory is our auditory sensory memory, which lasts anywhere between one to four seconds. Iconic memory is why you can see an afterglow of a sparkler, and echoic memory is why you can remember the last couple of words someone said around you, even if you weren't fully paying attention. Now, at this stage, autonomic processing takes place, meaning that the information we are gathering here is done without really any conscious effort. Now, if something does grab your attention, that information moves into your working memory, where it can actively be used. Now, realize working memory is limited. It only holds a small amount of information for a short period of time. To keep it active, we often use rehearsal strategies, such as maintenance rehearsal, which is when you repeatedly go over information to prevent forgetting, like when you recite a phone number to yourself over and over again. Or elaborative rehearsal, which is when you connect new information to something you already know, making it easier to actually remember the new information in the future. After that comes encoding. This is where information is transferred from the short-term memory to long-term memory. If encoding is successful, the memory gets stored and can be retrieved later when you need it. Oftentimes, to successfully encode a memory, it requires effortful processing, which is when you actively and consciously try to encode information. For example, using strategies like mnemonics or chunking. We'll go 
more in depth into encoding processes later in this video and later in the unit. All right, now that the information is stored in long-term memory, you can now access it when you need it. But retrieval isn't automatic. It usually actually depends on different cues, like the context that you learned the information in, or your emotional state, or even related associations. Different cues can cause us to think back to certain memories. This is why when you walk into an old classroom, you might suddenly start thinking back to vivid memories of school. Again, we'll go more in depth into encoding, storing, and retrieving memories in our next videos. So we can see that the big takeaway from understanding the multi-store model is that attention is critical. If your attention is divided, the encoding process breaks down, making it much harder to retain and recall information later on. Again, this is just another reason why you should remove distractions and limit multitasking while doing your homework or sitting in school, or honestly, really, when you're doing anything important. Okay, so the multi-store model shows us where information flows, but we still have one more model that focuses on how information is processed when we first encounter it. And this this model is the levels of processing model, which shows us that memory can be encoded on three different levels, from shallowest to deepest. Up first, we have structural encoding, which is the most shallow form of encoding. This occurs when you only pay attention to what something looks like. For instance, when reading the words on a screen, you notice whether a word is written in capital letters. Next, there is phonemic encoding, which is a little deeper level of encoding. This is based on sound, such as how a word is pronounced, or in my case, case, honestly, how a word is mispronounced. And lastly, there is semantic encoding, which is the deepest level of encoding. This occurs when you process the meaning of the information. For example, connecting the word ocean to your own memory of a beach trip. Generally, we can actually see that semantic encoding usually leads to a much stronger and longer lasting memory, since you have made a deeper connection to the new information. Now, when we look at both the multi-store model and the levels of processing model, we're reminded that that memory depends not just on where the information goes in the system, but also how much attention we give it and how deeply we process it. Now, if you do need any help with any of these models or concepts, make sure to check out my ultimate review packet and watch the exclusive videos and of course, take the practice quizzes. Next time, we'll continue our conversation on encoding as we break down unit two, topic four. As always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'm Mr. Sin, and I'll see you next time online.